Ladies and gentlemen, the microphone works. Good afternoon, I'm Bill Bennett. I'm the director of the Institute for Reproductive and Developmental Biology, which is Imperial's posh name for women's health. In 1994, I was a newly appointed and somewhat arrogant senior lecturer in this institution, or the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, which was this institution's uh, one, of their, one of the predecessors. And I went to a conference to see some work presented by a young research fellow called Christoph Lees. At this conference, he showed data which he had just published in The Lancet, which showed that you could use GTN patches to stop the uterus from contracting. And in the question and answer session, I got up and I said to him that I thought his work was biologically implausible. Such was my arrogance. <laughs> 20 years later, my National Health Service colleagues stole, now Mr. Lees, away from Cambridge University's Healthcare Trust to come and run our fetal medicine service at Queen Charlotte's. And when he arrived, I realized that he had actually matured into a researcher of some, some value. And I rapidly negotiated his transformation from the health service into the college as a reader. Almost immediately, he published another paper in The Lancet and acquired several million pounds worth of grant funding from the Medical Research Council and NIHR. So we had little choice but to uh, promote him to uh, a professorship, which is why he is here now <laughs> to give his inaugural lecture. And I'm hoping that the data you're going to show today is more biologically plausible. <laughs> You've got, you've got it. Great. Okay. <clears throat> I, I knew there was something missing, but I didn't quite know what. Uh, I, I almost feel, Phil, that an apology is due, but I'm here and hopefully will present some plausible uh, data. Uh, it's wonderful to stand here and talk to you about small babies, uh, gro fetal growth restriction. Although I'm very interested in many areas of fetal medicine, I'm probably best known for my work on uh, growth restriction, and small babies. And I'm going to give you a little overview of what we thought 25 years ago, what we thought 10 years ago, and what we think now could be the cause and could be the approaches in dealing with a uh, very serious condition that affects not only the baby, uh, but the mother. So let's start um, about 30 years ago, <coughs> reproduced in the uh, Sir Richard Doll lecture uh, just in 2012, uh, David Barker, uh, who, uh, his, his work is extremely well known, a big cohort of men and women pre-war being followed up uh, throughout their lives uh, to death, unfortunately. And he found that the smaller the baby, the smaller they were at birth, the higher the risk there was of mortality. And that mortality was particularly in the context of diabetes and cardiovascular uh, disease. The only difficulty with this is that we didn't know if they were small because they were just born a little bit early, or they were in, in fact small but growth restricted, and it's being small and growth restricted uh, that is the problem. Uh, some of you in the audience may be smaller than others, uh, you may be perfectly healthy and small. Uh, the, question is, uh, the question is, was there growth restriction, was your growth in utero restricted because that's where the risk lies. And because this data was derived from men and women in the 1920s and 30s, we didn't have accurate ultrasound dating of the pregnancy, and we didn't know, we didn't, David Barker didn't know exactly how long the gestation was. So all he could do is, is show inferences from birth weight in relation uh, to their outcomes and their blood pressure. So from, based on that, it's very difficult to know which babies are just small and which babies are growth restricted. And he did it in rather a clever way, which is looking at the placental to uh, birth weight ratio. So basically, if the placenta is very large and the baby is very small, uh, there is a strong likelihood that that baby is growth restricted. And this is placental weight, and that is birth weight. So if we look here in the higher reaches of placental weight to birth weight, you find that these adults, um, 
were, with big placentas and small babies uh, were much more likely to have high blood pressure. And of course, the converse is true that where the blood pressure uh, was, where the birth weight was much larger and the placental weight smaller, uh, therefore not growth restricted, blood pressure in adulthood was much lower. So very useful epidemiological findings, but it doesn't actually explain anything. It doesn't tell us what was going on. Um, within that cohort, it was possible uh, to uh, a certain number of these uh, babies that became adults, it was possible to work out exactly what the gestation was from certain menstrual periods. But it was, it was epidemiological level data rather than the sort of data we get now where we can very accurately data pregnancy. The Royal College uh, wrote the SGA guideline, Small for Gestational Age guideline, published in 2014. And I'm not going to read you everything here to, to your relief, but I'm going to say that there are two paragraphs here. One is small for gestational age, and the other is fetal growth restriction. And a baby can be small for its gestation. That doesn't mean it's unhealthy, it just means it's small. A proportion of those babies will be growth restricted. FGI is not synonymous with SGA. So about 50% perhaps of SGA babies are actually growth restricted. It does work the other way in that you might have a normal weight but destined to have much bigger weight, birth weight and be growth restricted but not small. But I'm not going to get into the complexities of SGA and FGR diagnosis. So <clears throat> those of you that are familiar with ultrasound, the normal range for abdominal circumference here and gestational age here, and a dot there denotes a small baby, but that doesn't tell us if it's growth restricted. And we classically understand much more about a baby's uh, growth uh, and, and uh, whether it's optimal, whether, it's, whether there's been some sort of restriction by looking at the uterine artery blood flow. Uterine artery supplies the placenta and the uterus. And here we have a very abnormal waveform with a notch and poor flow in the maternal uterine artery. And if you see that on both sides, that is bad news. That tends to mean a much higher risk of preeclampsia or growth restriction. And when we have that sort of circulation, it much, uh, it's much more likely to end up that you have a small baby with abnormal umbilical artery Doppler with reversed end diastolic flow in the Doppler patterns. So uterine artery, the maternal side is insufficient, leading to uh, fetal growth restriction and fetal Doppler changes, signifying hypoxia, low oxygen levels. For the last 40 years or 50 years, the explanation for this has been placental insufficiency, that the placenta has not developed properly. Uh, and it is fundamentally flawed and ab And I'm going to question that, and I want to see at the end if I've convinced you a little bit on this, because I don't believe it's the placenta's fault. But there is some very compelling work on this, reproduced in the American Journal just last year by Ivo Brosens and colleagues, Ivo Brosens, uh, was one of the pioneers, is one of the pioneers of placental work in fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia from a pathology point of view. And the issue in preeclampsia and growth restriction, or one of the issues, is thought to be just here, the spiral artery. This is the intervillous space where the blood mingles with the fetal blood in, in little villi. So that's the business end of the placenta. This is the mother's circulation through the uterus. So it's the spiral artery there that's the interface between the mother and the baby, between the placental bed and the, and the fetus. So what is supposed to happen is in very early pregnancy, this is a blood vessel, a, an arc, a spiral artery, and endothelium. <coughs> VSM stands for vascular smooth muscle. And gradually, the trophoblast, the developing placenta, invades both the endothelium and the smooth muscle to remodel it to become this, which is a new endothelium and a smooth muscle that has been damaged and removed. So you end up with a very dilated blood vessel. So this undoubtedly happens. And these are two very nice... Um, uh, very nice images of a transformed spiral artery and an untransformed spiral artery. And you can see this. Can you see the lumen of that vessel? It's big and wide and dilated. And the lumen of this is narrow and small. And this is an untransformed spiral artery. And the top one 
is a transformed spiral artery. You can imagine much more blood being able to flow through this blood vessel, flow through from the uterine arteries to the placenta, to the baby. In the 1990s, I was fortunate to work with two, uh, two, two world-leading pioneers, still world-leading world pioneers in the area. I was Professor Stuart Campbell's research fellow. That was where Professor Bennett first met me. Um, and uh, then I became Professor Kipros Nikolaides' subspecialty fellow. And both were extremely interested in complications of pregnancy, such as growth restriction and preeclampsia. <clears throat> Another thing happened or was happening as I became a research fellow, and we were developing and using uh, very impressive ultrasound machines that allowed us to look at blood flow. And it's to many of you in the audience who are using Doppler all, uh, all the time, you won't remember a time pre-Doppler, and I just about remember it when we had to use quite different equipment. Uh, but it meant that using these probes, you could see the mother's uterine artery and you could see the external iliac artery, and you could see the anatomy, the vascular anatomy, supplying the placenta and uterus. And from that, we could work out the sort of flow there was in the uterine artery, and we could relate the impedance, the resistance in that blood vessel, to outcome. And this is one of the early papers from 1994 from Kevin Harrington on this. And if we look at the blood flow through the uterine artery, you can imagine if it's high resistance, so notches and high resistance, well, that was associated with a much higher risk of uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, preeclampsia, and related complications. And if there were, there were the, the uterine artery looked abnormal in its morphology, and uh, the waveform looked abnormal, and there was a high resistance, there was a huge risk of adverse pregnancy outcome. So these studies from the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s, uh, started cementing our belief that the problem was a primary vascular one with a faulty placenta leading to abnormal blood flow, leading to preeclampsia and growth restriction. And this is a uh, lovely old image, a schematic of that happening. At eight weeks, here's the spiral arteries, and they're tiny and they're tortuous and they're very narrow. And at 16 weeks, they widened out because they've been cored out, and suddenly you get low resistance blood flow, low impedance blood flow, instead of high impedance blood flow. So the placenta's then awash with blood. So this was one of my first big projects uh, in the late 90s. Um, we, uh, we, we screened women at Sidcup and, uh, at, at, um, uh, and at King's, and we screened 5,000 women. So it was one of the biggest studies of its type at the time. And we just took all women and got the demographic data and recorded the PI, which is the pulsatility index, the impedance in the uterine artery. And we found, now, th this wasn't brand new. Others had done similar studies on smaller numbers and found that the identification of women with complications was actually not terribly good with the uterine artery doppler. It wasn't very good at picking up small babies overall. It wasn't very good at picking up preeclampsia. And this is one of my, I think this is one of my first PowerPoint slides from 1999. So I always show it. I know it looks a bit, looks a bit rickety, but I, I have a lot of um, uh, emotional attachment to it. Um, Sorry about that. You will see some slightly more sophisticated slides. So 7% of all the women we scanned had bilateral uterine artery notches, which is an abnormal waveform, and or high impedance in the uterine artery uh, circulation. And of those, 90% of the women who had preeclampsia, PET, 70% of the women who had SGA before 34 weeks, intrauterine deaths, they were clustered in that group of women with very abnormal uterine artery Doppler. So that was important because you might not be able to pick up preeclampsia and growth restriction terribly well from uterine artery Doppler, but the really severe complications were clustered in those women. And it wasn't a big step to say, well, OK, if, if the resistance is high in the uteroplacental circuit, then if it's very, very high, the risk must be very, very high. And if it's medium high, the risk is medium high. So we did, for the first time, uh, we did a likelihood ratio graph of the uterine artery pulsatility index against the likelihood of adverse outcome. 
And I'm very proud because this paper with uh, some uh, wonderful collaborators uh, formed the basis of what we now know as the screening algorithms for preeclampsia and growth restriction that are, that are now in the first trimester and combined with, uh, with, with uh, hormones as well to, to give much better diagnostic uh, and prognostic accuracy. Uh, but we found that if you were a smoker, you had a much higher risk of adverse outcome. If you're a non-smoker, you had a lower risk. Um, ethnic groups didn't particularly matter because you'd find yourself on the curve um, somewhere. And you could strongly relate adverse outcome to mean pulsatility index in the uterine artery supplying the placenta. So that's a maternal blood flow. So is it true? Is it all about the spiral artery and the failure of adaptation of the spiral artery? Well, let's look at just one or two studies of the association between looking at the spiral artery and the development of in, in, in women who've had deliveries because of preeclampsia and growth restriction and Dopplers. And let's do that first. And all I can say without showing a vast number of papers is that the relationship between spiral artery abnormalities and preeclampsia and growth restriction is at best tenuous. There is certainly some relationship there, but whether it actually explains the whole thing Probably not, because there are plenty of women with completely normal pregnancy outcomes who you sample the placental bed, and there are terrible spiral arteries uh, that are very thin and haven't been, uh, haven't been adapted at all to pregnancy. And likewise, there are women who develop severe preeclampsia and growth restriction who, uh, who have completely normal spiral arteries. So there's a relationship, but the relationship is certainly not clear. And this, those of you that scan, will not need explanation about this, but I'll, I'll just tell you this is a uterine artery waveform. Can you see there's bags of diastolic flow here? This is a lovely, beautiful uterine artery waveform at 26 weeks and 6 days. Lots of diastolic flow. So you would imagine that the spiral arteries here had developed and adapted beautifully well to the pregnancy. But there's a problem. This woman had an abdominal pregnancy. She didn't have a placenta at all. And looking at the uterine artery, you would think that that was a wonderfully transformed uterine artery waveform. But it, but it can't be, because there weren't spiral arteries in this woman. So there's something not quite right, not quite right there. Also, we are taught that in preeclampsia and growth restriction, there are very specific pathological abnormalities in the placenta. And again, uh, Brosen's um, back in 1965, beautifully described these abnormalities. I'm not saying they don't exist, because they clearly do, but probably in severe cases, selected severe cases. And you have atherosis here, and you have arteriosclerosis, you have intimal damage, you have clot, you have blood vessels that are very badly damaged within the placenta. So I, with Sangeeta Patak, who is my then fellow in Cambridge, um, she drew the short straw and did... Um, a study on all women who are consecutively uh, delivering in Addenbrooks. Of course, not all consented for the study, uh, but we collected their placentas, and we did something that no other study had done, which is we took the placentas and we cut them into blocks, and we gave them to two pathologists completely blinded. So they did not know which women had preeclampsia and which had growth restriction. And what did she find? No significant difference in macroscopic features and most histological features in preeclampsia uh, in, and, and small for gestation age babies. There were, interestingly, some relationships, particularly for infective and inflammatory uh, conditions of the placenta, histological conditions. So if you give a pathologist a placenta and say severe preeclampsia 26 weeks, I guarantee you they will find acute atherosis, uh, intimal damage, uh, vascular thromboses, all sorts of things. If you don't put any of that on, on, on the form, uh, then you might very well find something else. So if it isn't the placenta that's causing the problem, growth restriction, preeclampsia, then what is it? Let's just look at this schematic mother's circulation to the placenta and uh, the placental circulation. And what we see here is a number of papers that establish a very strong link between established preeclampsia and growth restriction and cardiovascular dysfunction in the mother. So if you have 
severe growth restriction, have very, uh, very severe preeclampsia, there is, uh, there, there is a vascular disturbance, of course, in your bloodstream. And actually, there is a, a, a risk that later on in life you will develop hypertension, or even immediately after delivery, you have severe hypertension. But when does this occur? When does this disturbance of the circulatory system occur? Chapman, back in 1998, just over 20 years ago in Kidney International, followed some women from very, very early pregnancy through later pregnancy to delivery and found, and this is about six, seven, eight weeks. I'm sorry, I haven't shown you the gestational age scale, but this is six, seven, eight weeks of pregnancy. And you can see in these women the cardiac output went up dramatically in the first two or three weeks after conception. The vascular resistance went down. Mean arterial pressure went down. So something <coughs> profound is happening at a very, very early stage in pregnancy, much earlier than we normally assume by seeing, we see women in the NHS at 12 weeks. Well, you've missed everything that has been happening cardiovascularly in those preceding 12 weeks. Let me tell you that. Amita Mahendru, uh, when we uh, did a study, preconception study in Cambridge, she recruited 140 women, healthy women, prior to getting pregnant and just followed their cardiovascular function throughout the pregnancy. And I'm showing you here the augmentation index, which is a, uh, which is a measure of arterial endothelial function. And she found at six weeks, six to 10 weeks, there was a profound drop in arterial, uh, arterial resistance, an improvement actually in endothelial function. So again, in very early pregnancy, there's very, very profound changes. And if you don't measure it at six or 10 weeks, you will miss it. <clears throat> now let's move on to the condition, early and late preeclampsia. And this takes a little bit of explanation. Um, we have two circles here that I've drawn on. So this is women with preeclampsia. And there are two sort of phenotypes here. Can you see this is cardiac output, cardiac output. So some women have very low cardiac output and very high vascular resistance. And they have preeclampsia. They have high blood pressure. Others have high blood pressure, but they have very high cardiac output and actually quite low vascular resistance. This is very important because it is very likely there are two types of preeclampsia and they are complete opposites. Early preeclampsia is here and most of these babies were growth restricted. Late preeclampsia is here and most of these babies weren't growth restricted. So the low cardiac output, high vascular resistance type of preeclampsia was associated with small babies and the other way around with the high output, uh, out output preeclampsia. <coughs> So that was Herbert Valencis back in 2008. And I just want to uh, show you a little animation uh, of what is happening, what is happening here. So uh, blood pressure is normal. And we, we've got blood vessels perfusing the placenta. This is the placental blood flow. And I'm really talking about the blood vessels pre that, that are perfusing the placenta. When there's insufficient flow, flow of blood to the placenta, of course, the blood pressure goes up. We think that's probably compensatory so that you can force whatever blood there is through the placenta. This is not a new theory. Uh, this is what has been thought for many, many uh, years. Vasky Thiliganathan and his group at St. George's showed very similar things to Herbert Valencies uh, in 2012 in hypertension here that in uh, gr growth restriction, in severe growth restriction, uh, the vascular resistance was very high and the cardiac output was very low. So there's a pattern emerging there. We can see, I think very few people would now agree that this is a form of preeclampsia that is associated with growth restriction. Jasmine, who's sitting in the audience somewhere, yes, um, spent three years of her recent life um, doing cardia cardiovascular... She, she's still a survivor, so well done. Um, uh, she, she took women with preeclampsia and growth restriction whenever they turned up uh, in our maternity service at Queen Charlotte's and uh, looked at their cardiovascular function, did uh, detailed cardiac and arterial function in them, fetal dopplers, fetal growth, and often ended up delivering them. What did she find? Well, this is a step on from Herbert Valencies' work and Baskey's work that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, actually, there is an early and late preeclampsia there is preeclampsia with 
fetal growth restriction. There's preeclampsia without fetal growth restriction. There's preeclampsia with fetal growth restriction, and there are healthy pregnancies. And women with fetal growth restriction, or indeed fetal growth restriction with preeclampsia, tend to have a low cardiac output. And although it doesn't show terribly well, women with fetal growth restriction, with or without preeclampsia, have a high vascular resistance. So it's a fetal growth restriction that seems to be particularly associated with a high vascular resistance. Whereas, oddly, in preeclampsia, we'd expect in preeclampsia the vascular resistance to be high. In fact, unless there's growth restriction, the, uh, the, the vascular resistance is low. <clears throat> so let's just uh, take a look at, uh, at an animation of, um, of this. Uh, we see a mother's heart pumping normally. And of course, the mother's heart develops and the cardiac output goes up with pregnancy as the pregnancy uh, grows. And um, that was nine months worth in one second. Um, very nice. And let's just look at that heart. If that heart isn't pumping as well, if the contractility is poor, as we see in growth restriction, then what happens? You've got to perfuse the placenta in the baby. So what happens to the blood vessels? They shrink. They shrink and they do this. You get constriction of the blood vessels uh, to maintain perfusion in the vital organs. And the vital organ here is the mother's brain, of course, and particularly the fetus, because nature is cruel in that way. Nature wants to preserve the fetoplacental unit. So the blood pressure goes up and the vascular resistance goes up. Um, I think I'll skip this slide except to say that fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia with fetal growth restriction go in opposite directions to preeclampsia. And that's really a key message uh, from this talk so far. So profound cardiovascular changes occur in very early pregnancy. I think we, we, we agree with that. Uh, well, I agree with Sorry, I'm, I'm asking you to agree with that. Uh, fetal growth restriction is associated with reduced cardiac output and increased vascular resistance. So, there's a question. The question is, do these cardiovascular changes predate fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia, or do they happen because of the fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia? And this is a crucial question, because if we know the answer to that, there potentially is a way of intervening. And if it's just a byproduct of the process that is fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia, then we, we probably can't intervene. And this is where Lynn, I don't think Lynn is here, no, but uh, Lynn and Julia Massini, working uh, with, particularly within Wilkinson and Carmel McHenry in Cambridge and, and the team at Imperial, uh, whose photos I've rudely not, uh, not put on this slide. Um, she, now, Lynn took just over 500 women. About 140 of those had already been recruited in Cambridge. So she got a group of 540-odd women prior to pregnancy. So these were women who were trying to conceive. We gave them pregnancy kits. We did lots of scans for them. They loved the study, and they get, a lot of them got pregnant, or at least two-thirds of them got pregnant. And we just followed them through pregnancy. Very difficult study to do, but she did it. And what did we find? Well, of course, from 500 women, you get 300 pregnancies. You get 100, uh, sorry, 350. You get perhaps 160, 180 ongoing pregnancies, possibly 200. So the number of adverse cases, preeclampsia and growth restriction is actually very small. But if we look at these women's cardiac output and vascular resistance before they got pregnant, and these are healthy women, all these women were healthy with normal blood pressure, normal BMI. Uh, if you saw them in a GP surgery and did the blood pressure, they'd be completely normal. But their cardiac output in preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction was lower, and their vascular resistance was higher if they developed weeks and weeks and weeks and months down the line if they develop preeclampsia and growth restriction. So prior to pregnancy, these women are predisposed to preeclampsia and growth restriction. That's enormously important because that's something we can potentially intervene in. And these numbers aren't trivial. I mean, this is on quite small numbers of cases because you need a massive study to have hundreds of women with preeclampsia or growth restriction. So they had 16% lower cardiac output and 18% higher vascular resistance. And this is where we move from fetal medicine to plumbing. Um, and 
Why? Well, we've been focused, and this, this is Herbert Valencies from Rome, I must thank for this slide, which I show all the time. This is the uterus and placenta. We're foc if your radiator stops working in your home, I guarantee, and we've done this recently, you go and bang the radiator, you unscrew it, you try and make sure that there isn't an airlock in it, you try and work out that the valve's working. Um, and as we did recently, we completely forgot the boiler was underfilled with water and about to blow up. So that is the problem. We weren't thinking about this, about the pump. And actually, this, this is what may be at fault, not this. We've been blaming the placenta for years and years and years. What does that mean for a baby if, the, if there's insufficient blood flow through the placenta, if there's uteroplacental insufficiency, well, the baby compensates initially. It conserves energy. It slows down in growing, redistributes blood flow. It then fulfills the definition of growth restriction, which is an abdominal circumference less than a 10 centaur and an abnormal umbilical artery doppler. And eventually, it conserves energy. It, it, it reduces the amount of blood flowing to the kidneys and the GI system and the periphery. And it increases the blood flow to the adrenals, coronaries, and cerebral circulation. And eventually, the fetal heart rate will become abnormal because the baby will be so hypoxic. And hopefully, we get to babies long before that and deliver them in good condition. But that's the consequence of having an insufficient placental blood flow. And as I uh, say, we want to get to a baby before this red box happens. So that is why we monitor these babies extremely carefully. And when the umbilical artery doppler becomes abnormal, we don't deliver immediately, but we know that things are getting serious. My very good friends and colleagues, Kurt Hecker, Katja Bilardo, Hans Wolf, and Eve Veal, uh, did a European study 20 years ago, and they looked at severely growth-restricted preterm babies, and they were monitoring them more or less every day, and then they uh, delivered at a certain point, and they looked back at how the monitoring parameters changed. And what they saw was that the ductus venosus in the baby, and I'll show you a picture of why that's important in a moment, and the short-term variation of the heart rate trace, they discriminated best in, the, in terms of those babies that needed uh, delivery. So the ductus venosus is just beneath the right atrium of the heart. It's a tiny vessel, but it's actually very easy to see because it's very high-velocity blood flow. So if you use Doppler, you can often see it instantaneously. It's a very, very bright vessel. And the important thing is that in atrial systole or uh, diastole, diastole is atrial systole, um, if there is high resistance within the fetus or a failing heart, uh, you end up getting an A wave, what's called an A wave, uh, coming down towards the baseline or reversing. And this is a very good indicator of um, abnormal heart function, particularly in severe growth restriction. So... Armed with that knowledge, we wanted to work out when the best time to deliver these babies was. So we ran the truffle study. So this was 20 centres and 512 patients. And we started planning for this in 2002, and the trial started in 2005 and finished in 2010. And it was, uh, it, it was, it was quite, quite hard work because these 500 women recruited from all over Europe had very small growth-restricted babies. We had to persuade them to take part in a study because no one really knew what the right time to deliver babies is. And this is another PowerPoint slide that I'm very proud of because I managed to make it animate, all the flags animate. So <laughs> there we are. I, I like that very much. Um, and it was a classic European collaboration and it worked extremely well. Um, and many of these centres are now uh, firm friends and collaborators for future work. And we found that in those women who were randomised to delivery when there were late ductus venosus changes, 95% of these babies at two years old were completely normal. Completely normal. And don't forget, these were tiny babies, 600, 700, 800 grams. Uh, and if we delivered them based on the standard of care at the time, which was heart rate trace then 85% of them were neurodevelopmentally normal at two years. Still a high percentage, but not as high as if you wait until the ductus becomes abnormal. So that has helped us understand how to monitor these 
very growth restricted, very preterm babies, we monitor based on the uh, ductus venosus and we monitor based on the CTG. And another important thing, we always thought that these babies had a very poor outcome, but actually in the truffle study, 8% uh, died antenatally or in the neonatal unit, which is 8% is high, but it's not nearly as high as we had counseled, 20 or 30% perinatal death rate. And cerebral palsy was much, much less common. 1% of babies had cerebral palsy. So very, very much less than we had counseled women. And that's important because it is not right to say to a woman with a small baby at 28 weeks, your baby may very well have cerebral palsy because that risk is actually low uh, in the context of modern fetal medicine and neonatal care. And if you are interested in, uh, in a summary of this, the paper published just in 2018 uh, is a summary showing all the nice little images of what we were trying to do and what we found in the truffle study. So don't wade through 12 papers on truffle. Uh, go to this paper in the American Journal in 2018. And it also allowed us to construct uh, graphs, or, or rather figures, that allowed us to understand if a woman was diagnosed at 26 weeks, 27 weeks, blah, 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 30, 31 weeks, uh, what the mortality and the morbidity was. And we could counsel properly for the first time. So if we made the diagnosis at 28 weeks, there's a 10% perinatal death rate and 50% severe morbidity rate. Uh, but if we then wait and prolong the pregnancy until, let's say, 30 weeks, watching very carefully, of course, with Dopplers and heart rate trace, then there's a 5% perinatal death rate and a 40% severe morbidity rate. So did you see that graph subtly change from there to there? So from diagnosis to delivery. So you've got two different sets of graphs there. That's the truffle group, uh, a great group, and we're now moving on to the uh, the, the truffle 2 study, which is later growth restriction. And later growth restriction is, of course, much commoner than early growth restriction. But there's also a problem there that we don't know when to deliver these babies. And you can deliver a baby at 33, 34 weeks and probably be okay, but, but there's a lot of morbidity in that. And when do we deliver at a good time for both the mother and the baby and perhaps allow a vaginal delivery rather than a cesarean section. Well, we monitor using umbilical artery Doppler, and that's normal umbilical artery Doppler. That is abnormal umbilical artery Doppler where there's absent end diastolic flow. And we know that just by monitoring these babies and doing the umbilical artery Doppler, somehow uh, the mortality reduces by 40%. But it doesn't tell you when to deliver. And if we look at uh, the cerebral artery instead, which is very easy to measure and the blood flow here, we can see that if a baby becomes hypoxic because of placental insufficiency, uh, the baby shunts blood up to the brain and there's much, much more blood flow and that's called redistribution of blood flow. So we see these things, abnormal umbilical artery doppler, abnormal middle cerebral, but it doesn't tell us when to deliver the baby. And really the question is, does abnormal cerebral Doppler predict an abnormal outcome, or is it just associated with abnormal outcome? I.e., should we be delivering based on cerebral Doppler or not? So this is the Truffle 2 study, which we will be randomizing women at 32 to 37 weeks throughout Europe, 52 centers now. Bonnie has been going and, uh, where's Bonnie gone? Uh, oh, there you are. Um, uh, visiting, I don't know how many centers, 35 centers in Europe in the last uh, six months uh, to set up this, uh, this huge study that was NIHR funded uh, just uh, last year. And we're going to recruit 1,500 women <coughs> to look at a difference in primary outcomes, so mortality and morbidity. Uh, and we're planning parallel studies on biomarkers, perinatal mental health, cardiovascular function, cost economics. So let's go back to our trusty radiator for the last few minutes of my talk. And um, let me show you something here. This is the umbilical artery, and this is the umbilical vein. And there's pulsatile flow from the baby to the placenta. And you can see a normal umbilical artery waveform. But if there's placental insufficiency, what gradually happens is the can you see the blood flow is having to push really hard to get through the placenta, and you've got abnormal umbilical artery Doppler with absent end diastolic flow. And look at the baby's brain. And this is very important because the brain circulation is opening up. The 
there's, there's less impedance in the baby's brain, and we're moving to a situation where, uh, you saw it just a moment ago, there's, there's much greater end diastolic flow in that cerebral artery. That's redistribution. Now, the question is, could this all happen if there's a problem with the mother's heart rather than uh, there's a problem with the placenta itself? And this is some data that Jasmine published just a few months ago in the American Journal. And I'm sorry, there are lots of colored dots. Ignore the dots, look at the line. It's not, it's not wildly exciting, but it is very exciting if you look very carefully at it. Cardiac output, the higher the cardiac output, the lower the resistance in the mother's uterine arteries. And as I explained earlier, low resistance is good. If the cardiac output Z score is very low, the resistance tended to be very high in the uterine artery. So if you had a mother whose heart was not pumping well, the uterine artery resistance was very high. And the slide hasn't quite worked, but the umbilical artery, so the blood flow in the, in the fetus, exactly the same was happening. If the mother's heart is not pumping well, and we've got a very low cardiac output, the resistance in the umbilical artery is very high. And we've confirmed this with uh, combining our data with many more centers and looking at this and the middle cerebral artery as well. And it's quite clear there's a relationship between the mother's heart function and the baby's, uh, the baby's Doppler status. And uh, I'll just show you this, that the smallest babies, the most growth-restricted babies with the most abnormal Dopplers, appeared to lose about 20 grams a day uh, in those final stages of pregnancy, whereas the biggest babies gained about 40 or 50 grams a day. So uh, this is by looking at women in the last two weeks prior to delivery who had small babies and normal-sized babies. So this, this is a slightly revolutionary concept. It's probably why we're finding it very hard to get this paper published. Uh, it won't be in the Lancet because no one quite believes this. But believe me, uh, this relationship exists. The very small babies do seem to lose weight. Um, and we find this is a real case, one of our patients who developed, um, uh, had, had a very small baby. And look at the growth of the baby here. So pretty static. And her cardiac output went down in the space of about two weeks. And at that time, the Dopplers became abnormal. So it's possible maternal cardiac output deteriorates leading to fetal decompensation uh, rather than there just being a worse placenta. So, is intervention possible? Ralph Scholten from the Netherlands, the Dutch have done a huge amount of work on this, took formerly preeclamptic women and exercised them, uh, and exercised them, gave them a specific regime. He took perfectly healthy women uh, after a normal pregnancy and exercised them as well. And he found that, yes, you can do something. So women who've had severe preeclampsia and have very low plasma volume, so not much blood in their circulation and high vascular resistance, if you exercise them, the good news is their cardiovascular function can improve. It improves to about the starting point of control healthy women before they exercise. So you can get them back onto the level they might have been at uh, before the preeclampsia. <clears throat> so this is good news because there are things I think we can do. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. It's a tiny molecule. It's a vasodilator. And I'm going to show you a couple of slides on old slides on GTN, which is glycerol trinitrate used for angina, and GSNO, which is not currently a drug, but it's something I've been using on and off over the last two decades uh, in women with severe preeclampsia and with, um, uh, w with uh, a research team now throughout, uh, th throughout the country. And internationally, we are trying to get a, uh, an MRC-funded study going on this. So Herbert Valencis and I uh, did a very small study. Uh, Phil would like this. Uh, so 40 women randomized to GTN or placebo, and these were all women at very high risk of complications. And we were very proud of this finding, that, uh, that uh, women on GTN patches, which vasodilated, improved blood vessel function, uh, had a lower incidence of composite adverse outcome. Now, I'm not going, you know, this is not proof. This is uh, small studies, um, small study that suggests there could be something in uh, nitric oxide donors in women at high risk of preeclampsia and growth restriction. Tom Everett, now a consultant in Leeds, uh, when he was with me in Cambridge, we infused GSNO, 
very potent nitric oxide donor that vasodilates and declumps platelets. And we found that there's a dose-dependent improvement in the umbilical artery Doppler of these babies. So you can improve blood flow in the babies by giving nitric oxide donors, which vasodilate, uh, and uh, you, you also want to improve their plasma volume. And strangely enough, if we go back to 2008, we find that Herbert Valencis published exactly the same sort of case, where he gave a woman with severe growth restriction nitric oxide donor, GTN, and plasma volume expanded her, reduced her peripheral vascular resistance <coughs> there, and moved the umbilical artery from absent endosynthesis flow to positive endosynthesis flow. So you can see these things happening. You can modulate uh, placental vascular resistance and fetal uh, Dopplers, uh, which hitherto, this is, this is not widely understood or believed, I think, but th this, can, this can be done. With Ed Mullins, who's also in the audience, um, we want to take women at particularly high risk of preeclampsia and growth restriction, so those that are uh, overweight and uh, smokers and hypertensives, and give them beetroot juice, which is a natural nitric oxide, uh, well, it, it has nitric oxide type activity, and we want to get them exercising, and just about to start a feasibility study where we'll be randomizing these women to no intervention or beetroot juice or exercise. Uh, and this is just a feasibility study before a properly powered uh, study that we plan to uh, run later this year. So really, it, it depends on what you believe. If you depend, believe the classic theory that it's all the placenta, then it's a bit depressing because we can't do anything about it. You can't transplant a placenta or improve a placenta. If you think actually that it's not that the uh, sun revolves around the earth, it's the earth revolving around the sun, and actually perhaps the initiator here is cardiovascular dysfunction, then there is a hope of improving things. And some, it, it took a while to get this talk together, but what I was absolutely scared stiff of is leaving someone's photo out, and I've just noticed that I have left. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, but this is the uh, team up until uh, 2019, a wonderful team of, uh, of very enthusiastic doctors, and uh, the, the team currently, uh, just say thank you very much, Rossio, for checking my slides and making them work and, and generally getting this presentation to, uh, uh, to, to be as nice as it is. Um, so thank you very much to all the fellows and collaborators with whom I've had a wonderful last 25 years and hopefully another uh, 25 years. Um, and thank you to Tom, Phil, Leslie, and Dirk Timmerman, who's not here today. He's um, a professor in Leuven uh, and bestowed a visiting chair on me. In fact, my first inaugural lecture was about 10 years ago in, in Leuven, but Dirk has been an immense supporter as a Tom and Phil uh, and Leslie, so thank you very much. And to our sponsors and <coughs> funders, and not least, and they're sitting in the front row looking slightly embarrassed, um, <laughs> but thank you very much because when I turn up at home at 9.30 and Dan says, you haven't helped me with my chemistry homework, that's why. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christoph. Entirely plausible, I thought. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Professor Lees? We've got roving microphones. While people are thinking, it just occurred to me, I know you have a lifelong obsession with GTN. Yes. And so you would use GTN to vasodilate the patient. But what about, um, what about using inotropes? in patients with growth restriction to try to make the heart beat more strongly? Well, that's, that's a very interesting idea. I think that um, we would, uh, the, the difficulty is some of these women have, have pre, have also have preeclampsia, and if we, if we weren't very, very careful, uh, using inotropes in hypertensive women, I, I think would be, would be a, a problem, uh, because they would leak they would leak, um, not blood, but they'd leak uh, fluid into their extracellular space and I think be at risk of pulmonary edema. 
But I think there is a circumstance where we could potentially use them, which is if we vasodilated. So vasodilated first, filled them up a bit, and yes, uh, anitropes might be, might be used. We haven't done that yet, although it has been thought of, because the first phase, I think, will be th therapeutically to run a, a larger study on vasodilating um, and filling women up because the women with severe fecal growth restriction have very poor plasma volume. They, they, they probably have about two, two-thirds of the sort of plasma volume that we, uh, we, we have walking around. So you need, to, you need to open up those blood vessels and give them fluids. Now this, I have to say, is completely contra contrary to classic teaching in preeclampsia. And you've got to be very, very careful about this because if you, and you can only do this with proper monitoring and knowing about the arterial functioning, and cardiovascular function. And I, I think Mandish is probably sitting there with a head in her hands thinking, oh my God, <laughs> please, please don't tell them this. Because if you then, if you fluid expand uh, someone who has high output uh, preeclampsia, you, you won't be very popular. And uh, <laughs> it will cause all sorts of problems. So I'm talking about you can only do this if, if you are monitoring a woman very carefully. You know her cardiac output, vascular resistance. And Herbert Valencies does this all the time. He, he, he quite safely, slowly plasma expands them and, um, and vasodilates them at the same time. It's a very careful balancing act. So I think what I'm saying is, you know, the theory is there. We've just got to be extremely careful how we do it. And uh, I'll, I'll leave uh, inotropes, which increase the, 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 the strength of how the heart pumps. I'll leave those for, um, for another study. Oh, but it's a, it's, a good, it's, it's a very good thought. You might know the questioner in the front row. I don't oh, know. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right. Not. Hello. Firstly, uh, as your brother, <laughs> I'd just like to say congratulations. You were always a great SWAT at school, but now I can see it's been put to good use. So well done. But as a cardiac anaesthetist, um, oh no, don't, don't ask. I, I wish we'd had a conversation earlier because I find some of this quite concerning. No, um, I just wanted to say: is there an incidence of um, peripartum cardiomyopathy that is in some way related to these changes? Because yes. Actually, where I work, we see that sometimes. Yes. And well, this, this is a really interesting point because our severe preeclamptics um, have often very poor cardiac output and they have very high vascular resistance. And our cardiologists often label them as having cardiomyopathy. And there, I was having a discussion uh, just two weeks ago with one of our cardiologists uh, who's, who's an expert on pulmonary hypertension. And... The question is whether severe preeclampsia with poor cardiac output and vasoconstriction is actually the same as what we used to call as a form of peripartum cardiomyopathy, uh, because these women take a very long time to recover and sometimes don't recover uh, cardiac, cardiac function as they, as they might. Very good question, Mark. <laughs> Another sibling in the middle here, I think. <laughs> Professor Franks. <laughs> well, first, Christoph, that was a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much for that. Um, early on in your lecture, you showed some remarkable changes in endothelial function in early pregnancy. Um, and I wondered, as an endocrinologist, whether hormones might be involved. The reason I ask is that if you look at cyclical changes in endothelial function, they're really quite marked. So you get a big improvement at mid-cycle. So do you think estrogens are involved in that? That's another extremely good question. Where's Raj gone? Oh, there you are at the back. So we, uh, so Raj, whose photo you saw a moment ago, is looking at uh, changes in cardiovascular function in women undergoing IVF and those having fresh and frozen cycles. And of course, some of them are very stimulated and have enormous levels of estrogens, and others, others don't if they have a frozen cycle. Um, and I think it's entirely plausible to consider exactly what you've said, and I suspect it's estrogen. Um, but we have exactly, we, we may come to you to, to discuss that data, because I'm not entirely sure how to look at that properly at the moment. But it's got to be something, it's got to be something, and it probably is estrogen. Are there any more of Christos' relatives in the audience who would like to ask a question? <laughs> Gentlemen here. <laughs> Hello, 
Yes, I'm a professor of statistics in the uh, mathematics department. I was really... Oh, that's not scary. Uh, that's worrying. Uh, <laughs> analysis, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Our question is a little more personal, yes. that there is a family history of uh, my daughter-in-law, of uh, what you call uh, early or loss of pregnancy, basically. Uh, and, uh, and I wonder whether there is a link. The analysis surely should extend, because it cannot be too far away. With, with miscarriage. I, miscarriage, yeah. And, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, in fact, we had a golden opportunity to look at that in the Conceive cohort that Lin Fu, Lin Fu and Amita Mahendri study because we followed women right through from very early pregnancy, uh, sorry, prior to pregnancy to very early pregnancy to delivery and afterwards. And the short answer is we thought there could be a relationship between preeclampsia and miscarriage and small for gestation age and miscarriage if they're all part of the same placental problem. Uh, but there wasn't. There, 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 there wasn't from a cardiovascular point of view. What I mean is you can't, you know, if, if a woman's unfortunately miscarried, then you can't see if she's got preeclampsia because it, 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 it won't happen. But uh, from a cardiovascular point of view, there were no differences. Well, it seems so, but of course... Some, many miscarriages are because of aneuploidy, because of abnormal uh, endometrial receptivity or endometrial... I'm straying, straying slightly out of my area, but endometrial receptivity <laughs> or, or aneuploidy. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the summary answer is that there isn't an obvious relationship between disorders of, that lead to miscarriage and preeclampsia growth restriction. Professor Furs. for not doing the homework I've ever heard. <laughs> um, however, I, I wondered, uh, with this sort of poor cardiac output situation, <laughs> what happens in the long term to these women, whether they get pregnant again, do they have that poor cardiac output irrespective of the outcome of the pregnancy? And do, do you, I know you're not interested really in what happens to women after pregnancy, but longer term in later life, do they have... Yes, yes, so there's now a reasonable amount of data on that on women who have um, longer term follow up after preeclampsia and growth restriction, and there is certainly an increase in risk of chronic kidney uh, disease and hypertension cardiovascular mortality. The problem with that is that none of these data have distinguished between the two isoforms of preeclampsia I've talked to you about. So the low output high vascular resistance type here with the small baby or the high output type. My very strong suspicion it's the women here with the low output and high vascular resistance uh, that are particularly at risk. But unfortunately we're a long way from following these women up properly because they do disappear because Young women are healthy in six months or 12 months after pregnancy. The blood pressure is often normal. No one's, no one's done an echo or looked at their heart function or the vascular resistance. And I, I think that's a real problem, actually. I, I do think um, I would love to have the money to set up a proper longitudinal follow-up clinic where we did cardiovascular measurements in, in these women. Because I almost guarantee you that if we separate out the two types of preeclampsia, those with high output will have much, much less in the way of cardiovascular morbidity than, than the, other, the other sort. Really enjoyed the talk. Uh, is the nitric oxide all down to vasodilation? Because nitric oxide can also improve mitochondrial function. Are you getting added benefits as well in terms of the overall fitness of the women? Um, well, the short answer is I, 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 don't, I don't know. Uh, we, we look specifically at the effect of NO on platelet activation and, uh, vas uh, and vasodilatation. Uh, yes, it has a myriad of other effects. I, I have to say we haven't, we haven't, looked, we haven't looked at, uh, at what you've inferred. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting idea. I'm going to hand over to Professor Tom Bourne, who is Christoph's long-standing collaborator and close friend, <coughs> to, uh, to offer a vote of thanks and to close the proceeding. That far, but yeah. <laughs> Could I get this off? You, someone was showing me to get Christoph's talk off. Give me a hand.
Well, first of all, I just want to say, Christoph, uh, what a fantastic talk. And it's obviously an honor to be asked to uh, propose a vote of thanks uh, for your talk. But it's customary to uh, say a few words about uh, the lecturer uh, at the end of these talks. So I'm going to do that. Um, so Christoph's outlined some of his work. Um, he's tried to present himself as an intelligent human being um, who works hard. And indeed he has. If you look at what he's been through, he's well known for his work on preeclampsia and cardiovascular adaptation. He's talked about that and growth <laughs> restriction. And I guess the truffle study is one of the biggest pieces of work he's done. Uh, he has a huge number of collaborators around Europe for that. But I think you can see here that in the middle part here, he's done a fantastic job of pulling together groups, uh, particularly in Europe, to do multi-centre trials. And that's not easy. If you look at what he's done with truffle, you know, I sort of almost think he should be negotiating our Brexit exit to try and uh, pull together that number of European groups effectively. And he also does a lot of other stuff as well. He's been the first ultrasound officer at the Royal College. He's been involved on subspecialty committees, NHS England. Internationally, he's on the board of the International Society for Obstetric, Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynaecology. So he's taking on a broad range of roles. And Truffle, uh, I, I contacted quite a lot of his Truffle uh, collaborators prior to this talk to say, you know, what they, you know, a few anecdotes about him, uh, asking for photographs. So I got a few photographs, Christoph. Um, most of them um, were, were reasonable. Uh, and even with editing, it's really hard work to find one without you having a beer in your hand, I have to say. <laughs> so it, it seems clear that alcohol is the main um, uh, reason or lubricant to get any kind of clinical research done. So um, <clears throat> um, probably you need to um, get your liver function tested. Now, this is, <laughs> this is actually Christoph, OK? Um, it's customary at these lectures that the, the, the new professor presents himself as this sage, you know, very so somber sort of person. I live in Fulham, uh, and actually so does Christoph. And it's not unusual to see Christoph wandering around Fulham um, <laughs> I have no idea why he does it. Um, <laughs> who knows? I'm sure he can tell you over drinks. Um, let's just take, say a bit about Christoph. It all started on the Isle of Wight, basically, and I think that explains quite a lot. I'm going to come on to that. And Christoph is from Ride, and here they are. Now, you saw the interaction between Christoph and his brother, and if you look at this picture, you get the feeling there's going to be problems later on, can't you? <laughs> um, here we have Christoph looking miserable. And here's Martin looking actually quite pleased with himself. <laughs> and you, know, you could see the dynamic just now during that talk. I mean, whose brother asks a question like that at a meeting? I mean, really, I have no idea. So they were brought up in Ride. Christoph then went to school in Ride. And you can see here he is looking very, very serious as a, as a boy. A bit of a swat, as his brother says. And he, at that time, was interested in politics. And uh, you know, this, this is some sort of strange political thing going on at school at the time. <laughs> I understand from one of his friends, that around this time, he wrote a complaint about education policy to the then government. So, I mean, you were really a bit precocious, weren't you? Let's be honest. The Isle of Wight, I think, is where you know, he formulated a lot of his academic ideas. It was, you know, it's a bit like Vienna in the turn of the century. There's a lot of really you know, big stuff going on in the island at that time. A lot of exciting ideas. I mean, really, um, <laughs> possibly the center of the universe. So you can begin to see that anyone brought up in this background would almost certainly become a professor at Imperial College. I mean, you can see that. Um, so it was an exciting place, uh, as you can see. Um, and I'd like to, I actually looked up his school. On, and he's on the wall of fame at his school. <laughs> so clearly, um, getting a chair here probably is really secondary to that, Christoph. So congratulations. I, I feel I should actually go and have a look at this myself, but there we are. But you have kept in touch, and you are now the chairman of the governors at your school. And I think that says a lot about Christoph, actually. He keeps in touch with his friends. He keeps in touch with his roots in the island. Uh, and, uh, and there you have him, you know, Christoph Lees, board of governors. Now, he then went on to Guy's. I can't think of anything good to say about that. Um, and then he went to St. George's. Um, so the two places, I think, where it probably influenced him most, I guess, would be St. George's. Um, now, that's me when I was very young, uh, and I was then uh, teaching surgery at the Centre for Surgical Technology in Leuven, teaching endometriosis surgery. And what were you? It was you, the lecturer. Yeah. Lecturer, and I was senior lecturer. So I, I taught, <laughs> so I tried to teach Christoph Lee's laparoscopic surgery. This was quite painful, I have to tell you. 
And shortly after that experience with me, he immediately dropped gynecology <laughs> and chose obstetrics and fetal medicine uh, as a career going forward. So I'm pleased to say I had that influence on you, Christoph, even if it um, was probably a reflection of me. I guess the biggest uh, thing for most of us who worked in ultrasound was, um, as you told you earlier, Christoph had the opportunity to work at King's, which at this time really was the place in the world to go and do ultrasound. It was an amazing place. Um, it, it had so many people there. It was an extremely highly pressurized place to work, uh, but anyone who went through that really had quite an experience. Christoph was trained up there, and I, at that time, was running the gynae scanning down on the seventh floor. Um, and if you just look at the number of people of that cohort who came out of Kings, there were an enormous number of people, either with chairs, relatively um, you know, high-profile roles, or in charge of fetal medicine units around London. And Christoph, uh, you're now added to that list, so you're in good company. Now, senior people in the college, um, I just need to say something about Christoph, because I was able to get hold of his application form. And you'll see that there's this bit down here, which you're supposed to fill in. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, I don't know why the college asked this question. No. And he lied on his form. He lied on his form. And I, I feel that you know, this needs to be looked into. Do you have any talents or interests? None. Are you interesting? Not really. <laughs> well, he lied about one of those, okay? No, Christoph is not really very interesting, I agree, no. But he does have some talents or interests. Now, you've already heard, he, he gave me a nice introduction. He he's obsessed with old PowerPoint, some, something from the 1970s. But he has these strange things that he likes to do. 1970s design, British Leyland cars, sailing ridiculously old, unbelievably slow, badly performing sailing boats. So, you know, his sailing's okay when he has someone decent on board, okay? <laughs> but it can go wrong. And I draw your attention to his boat. These are, these are X boats. Sail number X102, okay? This is quite important. Much more important than anything he said in his lecture. Now, just have a look at this sail number. <laughs> just have a look at that. Investigations, close quarters incident. Hmm, look at this, just read this. Disregard for the international regulations preventing accidents. The ferry continued to reduce speed, but nothing much happened. And, th and then another, this was fabulous. You know, the yachtsman within seconds, undaunted, the yacht continued. So the good thing about Christoph, he's determined, you know. He, <laughs> he, he, he will not be taken off course very easily. But what I love about the UK, this country is so wonderful. Look, they all come out to watch on the deck. <laughs> Like a, like a kind of blood sport just, just to see these poor people being crushed. Anyway, somehow it all was okay. But, you know, there you go, Christoph. And this is the other one. What is this about Christoph? He, he loves these kind of weird old cars. It's very strange. And I think in his head, he thinks he, he's, he kind of looks like this. There you go, look, okay? He's there with his kind of rusting heap of rubbish, like this, hi. And he has no judgment at all about these cars and what he has to buy. So, you know, this is the kind of thing you get. Tom, WhatsApp message, 8th of October. I've got an Audi Quattro. It's an absolute monster. <laughs> and you're going, oh, yeah, okay, Christoph. And then you get another one. Oh, I just picked up a Daimler. The electrics have failed. And it just carries on. Look, here you go. Here's the Daimler. Lovely. Five minutes later, there you go. It's being carried <laughs> off. What? You know, I really hope his ultrasound is a bit better than this. And there's another one of his cars I just found abandoned in a field somewhere. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a really strange habit, but, you know, it's all very, you know, it's, it's, it's so strange. So, moving on, I'm just finished on a slightly more serious note, for having told you a little bit more about Christoph's background. Just to say, he has done other stuff. He, he has lectured about some of his research, but he's published... Um, a number of textbooks. He's written probably the most popular book for patients who read about pregnancy, later pregnancy. He's an editor of the White Journal. He's been quite involved in politics. He formed the policy group at Civitas, and he's not uh, afraid of laying in to the General Medical Council or anything else he doesn't agree with. Under the guidance of Leslie Reagan and others, she uh, is part of the Doctors' Task Group, Doctors' Task Group into uh, supporting doctors. 
uh, which I think is very important, uh, and he's very passionate and committed to trying to support uh, doctors in terms of well-being and also in terms of uh, medical regulation. Uh, and that group is uh, quite a lot of important people who have some level of um, policy influence. And more recently, we together have published something about defensive practice uh, with that group, uh, which hopefully might have some impact on policy at some point. So, Christoph, um, to finish, we've had quite a few experiences together. We've traveled around the world pretending to actually lecture whilst going to bars and drinking. Um, and we've shared you know, quite a lot of big moments. You shared this moment with me at one point. God help me, I actually got married. So this is another big moment I'm very pleased to share with you. And I'd really just like to congratulate you on your talk and on your chair. And I'd invite the audience to show their appreciation as a vote of thanks uh, for your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Um, Christoph is available for all difficult questions now over drinks outside if you'd like to join him. <laughs>